there, you're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. And in the next half an hour, we'll see what's making the headlines with the journalist and author Christina Patterson and the political commentator Benedict Spence. We'll be speaking to them in just a moment. But first, let's see what's on some of those front pages. The Sunday Telegraph has an interview with the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, in which he tells motorists opposed to schemes like London's ultra-low emissions zone that he is on their side. The Prime Minister is going to announce millions of pounds of funding for a project to capture carbon dioxide emissions from across the country for offshore storage in the North Sea. That's according to the Sunday Times. The Sunday Mirror condemns Mr Sunak for taking a helicopter trip of 200 miles from London to Chester, owing to the amount of carbon dioxide it would release into the atmosphere. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Express carries a prediction that fuel bills will rise again this winter because the low number of storage facilities can't meet the high demand for gas. The Mail on Sunday heavily criticises the EU's plans to take fingerprints, facial scans and trip details of Britons entering the continent on what the paper describes as Big Brother visas. And a reminder that by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you're watching us. And tonight we're joined by Christina Patterson and Benedict Spence. So let's kick off. Great to see you both. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Christina, let's kick off with you. Front page uh, of the Sunday Telegraph leading uh, with an interview that they've got uh, with the Prime Minister saying that he's on motorists' side. Yes, well, this is uh, basically the, uh, the next election campaign kicking off. Clearly, what the Tories have decided is that they need very firm dividing lines with Labour. They're, depending on which poll you look at, about 20 points behind Labour in the polls. And obviously, they've just won two, they've just lost two out of three by elections. They hung on by their fingernails to Uxbridge and South Ryslip, largely because of Ulez. And the fact that they lost that, or that, that they clung on because of Ulez, I think has given them. Um, the impetus to make cars and car ownership and discrimination against cars a big issue in the next campaign. Now, I have to admit, I'm a bit torn about this because, as a driver myself, it is in an area, uh, in an area of London, where um, every road apart from mine seems to be made in LTN. So, you know, in fact, I've moved now. But up until last week, I was on a very busy high street with constant traffic and pollution, presumably, and all the roads around were, you know, a kind of obstacle course to drive through. So, I do have some sympathy for the fact that I think this is often done in a rather heavy-handed way. However, the fact is. And, uh, uh, that um, uh, Sadiq Khan has just won a court case um, showing, which showed that he was right to, uh, that he has conducted his Ule's um, consultation and plans correctly. And that, um, and he has shown that it has saved many, many lives. And this is the pollution in London and many cities is very, very serious and is killing people. And on top of all that, we have the net zero targets and the threat of climate change, not threat of climate climate change, the reality of climate change. And anyone who's been looking at the, the weather forecast and what's happening in Greece and throughout uh, Europe at the moment will have to acknowledge that climate change is real. So we have to take action. So by simply saying, I'm on the motorist side, it's crude electioneering and it may be effective politics, but I think it's immoral because we have to be thinking long term and in this country we always seem to think short term it's always about electoral advantage and that is, in my view is an immoral way to run a country and Benedict the Telegraph's also talking about the pressure the Prime Minister's under to cancel the deadline of 2030 for phasing out petrol and diesel cars it certainly seems <clears> that <throat> green policies may not be a vote winner uh, and there is pressure on, on the Prime Minister to perhaps give motorists what they're looking for. 
I think that this is, I think it's a bit of a gamble, this this approach, but I can understand the reasoning behind it. Most people, I think, in the UK would consider themselves environmentalists. They want to live with clean air, they want to see more trees, they want, uh, they you know, they don't like the idea of uh, climate change, they, they want a safer future. Um, but the problem is that this is often the case that you get with a lot of British voters, is that they're very in favour of something as long as it doesn't directly impact them. And you see this with things like reservoir building, with house building, with HS2. Everybody likes the idea of future proofing. Everybody likes being progressive, but they don't want it to impact them. And I think that this is very much, uh, I think that the Tories are sort of uh, picking up on this, that this is the case with a lot of potential swing voters, because we do need to remember, you know, still just about half of the population lives rurally in the UK, they don't live in big cities, and even those who do live in big cities, transport connections outside of London simply aren't viable for a lot of people, public transport. It will require an awful lot of investment to bring the UK up to scratch in that sense. We also, I think, uh, we are sort of creeping into the realms where we're beginning to realise that even if we do throw everything behind the idea of uh, low emissions and electric vehicles, that we still might not even have the technology to reach the target of 2030. There's a very interesting uh, story that's doing the rounds in the US about Tesla's inability to actually get its electric uh, cars, their range up to anything that's like viable long term. Um, and I think that this is something that we're all going to begin to see a lot more of. And that is not so much that people don't like the idea of a clean environment, but people coming to terms with the fact that actually the technology might not yet exist and the cost is prohibitively expensive, especially for a country like the UK, which, let's be honest here, we're not the United States, we're not China, we don't have the rate of growth that these countries have, uh, and therefore we simply don't have the funds to reallocate. So I actually agree with Christina. I think that for, for too long in this country, we have thought very short term about lots of things. But this is one thing that I almost feel that we've slightly reached too far. We've decided we're going to have you know, we're going to go for this sort of these environmental targets that this country physically, because it doesn't have the growth, physically can't reach in time. Um, and, and Christina, you touched on it before, uh, the fact that the Uxbridge by-election uh, really did suddenly make ULES a, a, an issue to be considered by both parties. And certainly even Labour now has some infighting over what to do with the policy. Keir Starmer urging Sadiq Khan to reconsider rolling out the scheme even further, and certainly uh, the Mayor of London's resisting. That story in the Express, yeah, I should no. say. Yes, well, um, it's a very, very difficult one. And I think it all comes down to actually um, the refusal of politicians to be honest about the cost involved. And uh, I think Sadiq Khan has made this a personal mission. He himself developed quite serious asthma and he has made it, you know, his, you know, kind of, he's absolutely determined to see this through. And let's not forget, it was Boris Johnson who started ULEZ. Now the Tories are trying to pretend that it's some kind of woke culture war thing. This is not a culture war. This is actually about people, children getting serious illness and people dying. So I think, as, as Benedict said, you know, I think, it would be very hard for anyone to say, oh, no, let's have filthy air. Everybody in theory wants clean air. Everybody in theory wants to tackle climate change. But the fact is this stuff costs. And what is very cruel is that, generally speaking, the people who pay the highest price for these things, including, of course, Brexit, but for any radical shift, are people with less money. And so the people who are really paying a price on ULEs are the people who can't afford to upgrade their cars or vans, who are losing Thing. I've, I've read, you know, uh, tradespeople maybe up to 21 days of paid work a year because of the costs of having to pay for a vehicle in an ULEZ area. These costs are not insignificant. For many people, it's the difference between having a viable livelihood and not having a viable livelihood. And so the question really is, who pays? What help do they get? If you introduce schemes like this, then you do have to offer people support. You can't just say, OK, we're changing everything and you've got to somehow pick up the cost, even though your energy bills have quadrupled, even though your mortgage, thanks to Liz Truss, has gone through the roof, even though your rent has gone through the roof, even though the inflation has soared and food has gone up to record levels. It's it's just not fair. So I think it's a really, really difficult thing for, for people to solve. And I understand why the Labour Party is torn on this. 
I think the Tory, the Tories are also torn on it, but it so happens that Rishi Sunak has chosen to take the kind of culture war view that, you know, let's let's kind of pretend that we can just be you know, kind of relaxed about all this and be on your side. It's not as simple as that. And actually, if the Tories want to have any younger voters in the future, it's really short-sighted because younger voters absolutely understand the reality of climate change. Many are not car owners and they are rightly terrified about it. Yeah, you do make a very good point there when it comes to younger voters. And certainly if you look at uh, the front page of tomorrow's Sunday, Mirror Benedict, uh, they're calling the Prime Minister a hypocrite for taking a helicopter to Chester from London. Your thoughts? Uh, this sort of thing, this sort of thing irritates me though, because it's such a small fry story and it's a small fry attitude. Rishi Sunak taking a helicopter from point A to point B has no effect on climate change. He is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and be it on party business, be it on government business, he is one of the most important people in the Western world. Things like efficiency, things like security, these are the few things actually that I think we should all be able to sort of turn around and go, yes, we can agree that, okay, it's not the most environmentally friendly thing, but actually the head, you know, the head of the government should be able to travel in a helicopter for his personal convenience, for his personal safety. I happen to think that the leader of, of the opposition should probably be afforded the same thing. No other country has this kind of discussion. And I do understand we don't like our politicians very much in this country. We seem to think that they should live a slightly monastic existence. And they do sometimes, you know, uh, let themselves down. We all remember the expenses scandal. But this is one of those things where I just kind of sit there and I think, well, in the grand scheme of things, I would rather Rishi Sunak was traveling to different places in a helicopter if it got him there fast and it was secure. And that would be the case no matter who the prime minister was. We have to slightly get out of this mindset of saying that we have to treat our prime ministers, they have to wear hair shirts and they have to sort of walk everywhere. That's not really a very useful way for them to conduct government or party business. Uh, well, I, I saw Christina nodding in agreement to some of what you were saying there, Benedict. We'll give you both a little bit of a breathe, breather and see you in just a moment. Thanks so much. Do stay with us. Coming up on the press preview are so-called Big Brother visas, a price worth paying for getting Brexit done. We'll be discussing that and more next. Welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. With me is Christina Patterson and Benedict Spence. Uh, Christina, let's kick off uh, with the Express page five. Uh, a warning from David Frost, that Brit you know, Britain's chief Brexit negotiator. He's warning that the Conservatives need to start talking up the benefits of Brexit or face the consequences at the ballot box. Yes, well, uh, David Frost yet again showing that he really does live in a parallel universe. He is the person who negotiated this appalling Brexit that has had such a disastrous effect on our economy and on so many aspects that, that lost us access to so many beneficial schemes that we were part of. And here he has the gall to say that the Tories must talk up the benefits of Brexit. I think the, t the reason the Tories rarely mention Brexit these days is because even they know, and even the ones who supported Brexit know, that actually there don't seem to be any benefits of Brexit. And all of the polls show that the vast majority of people now regret voting for Brexit, including one mentioned in the Express, which, by the way, was pro-Brexit. Um, uh, I think it's what's it called, an omnisysis poll. I've never heard of them before. But that says that 62% of people say, with hindsight, it was wrong to, to leave the EU. People are really paying a very heavy price. And as I said before, as always, it's poorer people who pay the higher price. Our economy is performing extremely badly compared with most in Europe. We are in danger of becoming, in fact, we are fast becoming the sick man of Europe. So really, for this man to talk about talking up the benefits, he also says in this interview that he wants to kind of bring back the spirit of 2016, the spirit of hope. Does he not realise that the spirit of 2016 was that people unfortunately, because they were lied to, were led to believe that, that Brexit would bring all kinds of benefits and freedoms and economic improvements and money to the NHS, all of which have been pro proven to be completely wrong. So really, the man is deluded. And the sooner he shuts up and the sooner we get greater access to the EU, the better. 
Do you agree, Benedict? Lord Frost here saying we need the same injection of excitement when it comes to the possibilities of Brexit as we saw in 2016. I think what would be very beneficial is if Tories stopped talking about how we need to talk about the potential benefits of Brexit and they actually recognise that Brexit gave them a huge mandate to do all sorts of different things that they have steadfastly failed or refused to do. You know, we need to think about what the promises were. Take back control. What does that mean? Take back control of your borders. Have they done that? No. Migration, illegal and legal, is up. Does it mean things like, for example, cr clamping down on crime? You one would have thought so, yeah. and yet crime is up. One would have also thought it would mean taking control of things like your economy. But, you know, the European Union is not doing particularly well right now, economically, for several different reasons. This was supposed to be the opportunity to decouple ourselves from the regulation of Brussels and to kickstart our economy. Has that happened? No. Well, and broadly speaking, I Benedict, think it's while, because... Just while you're sure. on this, I think it's a good time to bring in the front page of the mail and get your thoughts on that as well while we've got time. Uh, you know, while well, we've got Lord Frost saying, let's talk up Brexit, you've got the front page of the Mail saying, you know, there's holiday chaos uh, because of big brother uh, visa rules being imposed by European countries. What's your take on that? Well, this is the sort of thing that I would have thought a lot of Brits would be at least vaguely happy about because I thought they didn't like the idea of an overbearing EU state imposing regulations on people. And, you know, this is not just something that's being wheeled out to holidaymakers. It is part of broader security measures. But at the same time, we've got to remember that I thought, I was uh, under the impression that one of the big electoral issues in this country is security at our border, which apparently we don't have very much of. So it would be a little bit churlish for, you know, the same people who are saying, well, we need greater security of Britain's borders to then turn around to the EU and say, oh, but you shouldn't have so much. But we also need to remember that this is something that doesn't just affect the UK. There is uproar in the United States about these new regulations, which means that people who want to travel to Europe from the US will have to wait for two weeks whilst they go through background checks. And their system is going to be a little bit more intrusive than ours. This is something that may end up inconveniencing British holidaymakers. Actually, what I suspect is it'll end up ticking off an awful lot of European businesses because they find it harder to get people to come from the US. I don't think they care too much about British holidaymakers, but it will be people from the US, it'll be business people, it'll be holidaymakers, it'll be second homeowners, there'll be all sorts of things that get inconvenienced by this. And I think that a lot of Europeans will turn around to the local MEPs and say, well, hang on, we don't have great growth as it is. Why are you putting an additional block on us having any kind of trade with the with the world's biggest economy? It doesn't make any sense. And Christina, a brief view from you on this, um, if I may, you know, your thoughts on these, um, you know, more intense checks for British travellers going to EU countries. Well, I think the EU are entirely entitled to do it. Uh, they absolutely do need to secure the borders with the EU. As someone who's half Swedish and was born in Italy, I'm not looking forward to being fingerprinted before going to my mother's country or the country of my birth, which I do quite a lot. But this is a reality of, of leaving the EU. So personally, I wish we hadn't left the EU. I will find it a major irritation. I don't blame the EU. You wanted Brexit, British people. This is... Join the conversation. Put your comments and suggestions below in the comment section. Thank you for subscribing to this news channel. You will be notified of any breaking news and new post as you become part and parcel of the TAO Media family. Please like and share TAO Media. We love you all. Please support TAO Media Foundation by joining membership and visiting Amazon UK to purchase the displayed books to aid our orphanage projects across Africa.